three quarters of our planet is covered in water. The great oceans are sparsely populated, equivalent to huge deserts. Creatures of the deep must travel far in search of food. But here and there, submerged mountain peaks break through the waves. Remote islands in a desert sea. Ocean oases. 12 million years ago, there were volcanic eruptions beneath the Atlantic Ocean. Today, the huge peak of one of those volcanoes forms an island off the coast of Brazil. Since then, the island has been shaped and reshaped by unremitting forces of nature, blasted by salt-laden southeasterly gales. There's little topsoil. Vegetation has to be tough to survive. Some parts are almost a desert. The island presents an inhospitable face to the passing mariner, but beneath its waters lives one of the largest resident dolphin populations in the world. The Portuguese discovered Fernando de Nerona 200 miles off the northeast shoulder of Brazil. That was about 1500. It was another century before the first settlers landed on these shores. Over 400 years after the Portuguese arrived, Fernando's sandy beaches remain totally deserted. The northern side of the island is shielded from the worst of the elements. It's dominated by Mount Pico, a thousand-foot-high landmark visible 30 miles out to sea. Here, too, is the only safe anchorage. Fernando lies where two ocean currents meet. It seems strange that an island only six miles long and just under two miles wide should have two such distinct climates. The southeast coast is battered by strong winds and waves up to 15 feet high. Together with Fernando's isolation, this has meant that people have only recently begun to explore beneath these waters. The relentless pounding of the ocean has carved the volcanic rock into a submarine world of caves and chasms. the perfect environment for Fernando's abundant underwater life. Yellow snapper in their thousands glow in the sunlit shallows. Such numbers need a reliable food supply, mainly algae and small crustaceans which live among the rocks or on the dense growth of seaweed. This sunlit upper world is home to blue surgeon fish. Yellow demoiselles and margates. Sergeant majors, the day shift. The night workers and the juveniles are further down under the rocky ledges. The caves provide shelter for young snapper and nocturnal feeders like Sailor's Choice or Sheep's Head Bream and big-eyed soldier fish who wait for daylight to fade. Although Fernando's a volcanic island, parts of the underwater landscape look like a coral reef where the lava rock's been eroded into archways and caves. Some of them are dormitories for the big night hunters, nurse sharks that spend the day sleeping. They're shy creatures, and if disturbed, make off for some other hiding place. These tropical fish would normally live on a diet rich in plankton, but that's in short supply around Fernando. They've had to adapt to what is here, 
The rocky coastline, strong currents and pounding surf have always provided a natural defence for Fernando's southern side. The more sheltered northern side offers an easier approach, so the Portuguese built a fort overlooking the main anchorage. From the 18th century until the 1980s, Fernando was used as a prison, mainly for political internees who were harshly treated. The landscape suffered too. Many of the trees were cut down in case the prisoners made rafts to try to escape. When Portuguese occupation ended in the 19th century, the island came under Brazilian control. Today, it's a national marine park. Cannons once defended these shores. Now it's the task of the Brazilian Navy. In 1987, one of their corvettes, like this one, hit a rock and sank, fortunately without loss of life. It's now become a fascinating artificial reef, but at 60 meters down, well beyond the usual safety limit, it's only for experienced divers. Rather surprisingly, the Iparanga came to rest upright. She's 45 meters long and now coated in simple but beautiful life forms, mainly algae and small sponges. The wreck soon becomes a target for colonization. It's a focal point for new life, increasing the underwater population, an ocean oasis in miniature. And a challenge for explorers from another world. Among the established residents are nurse sharks. They rest on their pectoral fins, raising their bodies to make an enticing shelter underneath. But any small fish or crab venturing in stands no chance. There's plenty of room for all. A shoal of jack cruises by. The Iparanga's upright position makes it safer for divers to move about inside. Soldier fish shelter under the bridge, just as good as a cave. Divers respect the small items like lamps, chart tables, telephones. Anywhere else in the world, they would probably have been taken as souvenirs. The ship went down so fast, the crew had no time to save anything but themselves. Their uniforms are still hanging in the lockers. For today's visitors too, time is limited. Outside, a stingray glides past with a flotilla of jack. They have all the time in the world. Every surface has been colonized by some form of life. At this depth, there's not much daylight, so marine growth is slow. The steel hull is now covered in algae and small sponges, just what a French angelfish likes. The sandy bottom around the Iparanga makes good hunting for the nurse sharks. They're mainly scavengers, but they also eat crabs and other shellfish hidden in the sand.
After such a deep dive, a slow and careful ascent, with stops on the way to help remove the nitrogen in the bloodstream. From the deep waters of the western coast to the shallows of Rat Island in the east. The rocky cliffs are open to the full force of the elements. Seen from below, the surf looks like gathering storm clouds. But it's less than 10 metres to the seabed. Sunlight penetrates, seaweed grows and algae live on the weed perfect for a large fish population. Butterfly fish usually eat coral polyps. Here they thrive on algae. Some fish indulge in curious behavior. A tile fish, relative of the moray eel, moves small stones from one pile to another. Is it looking for food? or building a home. Fernando is such new ground that very few people have studied behavior patterns like these. French angelfish thrive here growing to over half a metre across. And there are some very friendly parrotfish who seem completely at home in the forest of weed. Although they're coral crunchers, they've adapted to scraping algae from the rocks with their strong beak-like jaws. Goatfish rummage for food among the sand and shale. Rats stay close to pounce on anything that escapes. A solitary barracuda cruises past. The male boxfish comes almost gift wrapped, but the female blends with the surroundings. A ras has found a shellfish. The problem is how to get at the meal inside. A stone anvil is the answer. When disturbed, a gurnard spreads its pectoral fins and flies through the water. Usually a secretive fish, the extraordinary peacock flounder leaves the safety of the sand. An eagle ray has found some shellfish. Its extended jaw shows why rays belong to the shark family. Clouds of cave sweepers cram the undercuts perfect shelter from bigger predators who can't maneuver in such confined spaces. Juvenile fish can grow up here in relative safety. French angelfish are very inquisitive, but they're only really interested in what can be gleaned from the stony seabed. Juvenile yellow snapper shelter under the ledges, waiting for night to fall. Then they'll split up into smaller groups, venturing out to feed on the surrounding seabed. In a bigger cave, a shoal of sheep's head bream also wait. These densely populated caves are proof of the need to adapt to survive. Without coral, which grows only sparingly around Fernando, some of the organisms that small fish eat either don't exist or are found in different places, on seaweed or among rocks. 
Another staple diet for tropical fish is plankton, but by the time oceanic currents have crossed 3,000 miles of the Atlantic, much of their plankton has been taken. Because these species have learned to adapt, the waters around Fernando are teeming with life, self-sufficient and self-renewing. Black triggerfish feed below the waves which constantly shape and form the island. At the western tip of Fernando de Nerona, the sea has carved out a massive cavern in the basalt rock, the Caverna de Zapata. Stingrays lie buried in the sand, relatively safe unless they move. After about a hundred meters, the cave comes to a dead end. A short distance from the entrance in open water is Zapata Rock, the tip of an underwater mountain which almost breaks the surface. At the base of the rock, 30 meters down, a narrow crack leads out onto a flat seabed. The perfect hunting ground for eagle rays. Yellow snapper are everywhere, almost a Fernando trademark. Higher up, the current accelerates round the rock. A turtle shelters in the lee side. Even at 15 meters down, a young hawksbill turtle has to steady itself against the strong surge. For divers, it's like being on a roller coaster. On the rock that sank the Iparanga, a large barracuda has to work hard to hold position against the surge. Shoals of demoiselle feed near the surface. This ocean oasis has many marine habitats. Sunlight penetrates the warm waters, allowing algae and sponges to grow, a self-replenishing food supply for the residents. Small fish hide and feed among drab grey sponges, but others are brightly coloured. The angelfish use his colour to warn off predators, or it can take refuge in rocky crevices, the crayfish's preferred home. Cleaner shrimps wave their feelers to attract passing traffic. A small wrasse helps them clean a coral grouper. At mating time, the male surgeon fish darkens to attract females. A circular dance is a sign of successful pairing. Other fish come together to feed. Golden trevally join goatfish as they search the seabed for small crustaceans. 
A shoal of surgeon fish harvests the rock until it's almost bare. A margate looks for crabs and other crustaceans. It's shadowed by a black jack, which cleans up any scraps. A French angelfish and a wrasse follow them on the food trail. A young octopus makes a jet-propelled getaway. It's changed color and texture to match the background, but it's still taking chances being out in broad daylight. Almost every species here is likely to be preyed on by another. A yellow spotted moray eel, a night feeder, takes a rare daytime excursion. It seems to be looking for somewhere else to live perhaps a bigger crevice to lurk in. When they're disturbed, stingrays usually dig deeper into the sand. This one decides to make for the surface. But there's one more wonder to discover on Fernando. A sheltered bay on the northern side is the setting for the island's most spectacular natural phenomenon. Every afternoon, the spinner dolphins prepare to leave for the deeper ocean. Watched over by generations of nesting boobies and soaring fairy terns, the dolphins were here long before man. Just as the terns are masters of the air, so the dolphins are masters of their element. Dolphins are leaving to spend the night cruising the deep ocean where they feed on fish and squid that rise to the surface. In the morning, they return to Dolphin Bay where they rest, socialize and mate. They're the largest residential school of spinner dolphins in the world. More than 600 live here. Dolphins are smaller members of the whale family. Females calve every second or third year. They suckle their young for at least seven months and look after them for up to two years. Then the juveniles join the school as independent adults. A dolphin's top speed is about 40 kilometers per hour. Powerful muscles drive them along with vertical tail movements while they use their pectoral fins for balance and direction. Because they're mammals, dolphins need to breathe. Their lungs can stand huge pressure changes. They dive as deep as 300 meters. The spinner dolphins symbolize Fernando de Nerona's dual nature. To mankind, however beautiful it may seem, it's an inhospitable place. 
but to species which have adapted to this environment, it offers shelter and abundant food supplies. A true ocean oasis.